Dreaming of America, an Ellis Island story written by Eve Bunting. The SS Nevada steamed out of the harbor and into the open seas. Her decks were a bustle with men, women, and children, some still dragging their trunks and boxes. Annie Moore and her brothers, Anthony and little Philip, stood at the railing, watching Ireland disappear into the mist. Gone, Annie thought. The word had the awfulest, loneliest sound. Just last night she had been dancing at the wake her friends had given for the leaving. There had been sad farewells, but there had been music and singing and laughter too, and now her friends were lost to her forever. Will we be back, Annie? Philip asked. Annie tightened her arms around her little two, her two little brothers. I hope so. Sad thoughts crowded into her mind. What if their mother and father weren't there to meet them when they landed in America? It was three years now since they'd been seen their parents. For three years, Annie and Philip and Anthony had lived with Auntie and Uncle in the wee warm house in Cork that was truly home. Would she ever see it again? Would she ever see them again? She never forgot the heartbreak in their face as they'd said their last goodbyes that very morning. Annie swallowed the tears that came with the memories. Annie! Philip touched her hand and turned his face up to hers. I know what we can do, Annie. We can make a lot of money in America and send tickets for Auntie and Uncle the way Mammy and Daddy sent them for us. A man leaning on the rail next to Philip asked, Are you traveling alone? No. I've got our Annie and Anthony, Philip said. The man smiled. I meant with your parents, without your parents. They're waiting for us in America, Annie told him. She liked the look of him. He was older than her uncle, small as a bird in his brown tweed jacket. He wore a soft hat that drooped back in front, and he had a red bow tie that perched on the point of his Adam's apple. He took off his hat. I am Victor Kirschenblant from... Russia. I boarded ship at Liverpool. Annie bobbed her head. We're pleased to meet you, Mr. Kirshen. Call me Mr. Victor, please. We'll be easier. They shook hands. The boys, too. The Nevada gave a lurch as a, as a swell hit it, and Anthony held onto Annie's arm. There's no land behind us anymore, he said in a scared voice, and none in front, Mr. Victor said. Just water in the promise of America. Faced the ship's bow as it plowed and bored into the gray ocean. Annie shivered. Her new suit was not warm, and the boots Auntie had bought for her were thin, too. She pulled her short jacket close about her. May we ask why you are going to America, Mr. Victor? I have a son in Philadelphia, he shrugged. It is also very dangerous to be Jew in Russia. Can you teach us Russian, Anthony asked. Da, he smiled. That means yes. Perhaps a few words you will like. Da, Anthony said. Annie hugged her arms about herself. Tis ever so cold. I should take my brothers below. We will meet again, Mr. Victor said. He held tight to her brother's hands as, she, as they leaned against the wind and whistled along the deck. She pulled open a door to the stairs and they made their way down, 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 past several decks lined with cabin doors. Anthony clutched at Annie's arm. Are we below the ocean, Annie? We are. Isn't it exciting? Can the water not get in? Not at all. No more than the rain could get in our house at home. She was checking the numbers on each cabin against the label they'd been given as they boarded. Here we are. You open the door, Philip. They stood staring into the cabin. Isn't this the nice wee room now? Annie asked shakily. Cozy, just for the three of us. In truth, it wasn't cozy and not that nice either. There were no windows in their cabin. The only furniture was a wash stand with a mirror over it and three iron beds, two of them stacked on one on top of the other. Annie longed for the poppy wallpaper in their little attic bedroom at home. She longed, too, for the smell of the mothballs Auntie kept in their wardrobe. She never thought she'd miss the smell of mothballs. Can I have the bed on top, Philip asked, beginning to monkey climb. Annie pulled him back. You may not. I don't want you falling on your head. I'll be up here, and you'll be below me. Anthony will have the bed against the wall. What's that noise? Little Philip held his hands over his ears. It's the big engines that make the ship go, Annie shouted. I think we're right on top of them. 
In the corridor outside, babies cried, trunks scratched along the floor. A voice called, Bridget, and someone answered, Save us all, we'll be suffocated down here. Tis like being in a coffin. A cabin door slammed. Their bag with the third class label was sitting on by the door. Beside it was the brown paper parcel Auntie had handed them before they left. For Christmas, she whispered, a wee bit of home and a little something inside for your birthday too. A kushla. You can open it on the big ship the day you become fifteen. She'd hugged Auntie tight and think of us, darling. I'll think of you always, Annie had said, speaking through the thickness of her throat, always. She opened the suitcase now and removed the two pictures she'd taken off the wall of their bedroom. There'd been white patches on the poppy wallpaper where they'd hung for so long. One was of their mother and father, the other was of auntie and uncle. She set them on the washstand. There, she said, now will not be so lonesome. Philip started to cry. I want to go home, he sobbed. Annie rocked against him against her. It'll be all right, so she murmured. Aren't you going to go aren't you going to our new home in America? Mr. Victor was their special companion during the voyage. I take you under my feathers, he told Anthony, and Anthony giggled. You mean wing, he said. Mr. Victor groaned. I try hard not to make mistake. You speak grand, Annie said. What is Russian for friend? The word in English is good, Mr. Victor smiled. I like, that, I like that you use it. He sat next to them at the big wooden table where they ate their food. There were plenty of potatoes and bread. One night there was stew, not like Annie makes. Anthony spat a knot of gristle into his hand. After the third day, it didn't matter what food they got, none of them were eating. A great storm had blown up and the ship rolled and lurched. The seas battered and smashed across its decks. Nobody could go outside, and the smell of sick was everywhere. The ocean heaved, the ship heaved, and every every stomach aboard heaved with it. In the cabin, there was no escape from the banging of the engines. It pounded in their ears day and night. They were so close to the bow, they could feel every thump and slurp of the ship meeting the waves. Are we going to die, Annie? Little Philip's face was the pale green of the underside of a leaf. No, Akushla, we're safe as can be. She wiped sweat from his forehead. What if little Philip died here in the middle of his awful ocean? It'll pass, lovely, it will, Anthony groaned. Night and day she watched over them, dragging herself down from her top bed to hold them and to pray. Mr. Victor brought drinking water to the cabin. Once he brought a bowl of soup, big enough for the three of them. Where did you get it? Annie asked. I have made a friend of, of steward in first class, Mr. Victor said. He is also Russian. He tells me that even the rich are not eating in this storm. We are under his feathers, Annie thought, and we are safer when they are covering us. Then one day the storm was over, and they were still alive. Up on deck they breathed in the ocean gusty air. Philip lifted his face to the sky and said, Blessings, blessings, blessings. Annie and Anthony laughed. That was what Auntie said when she got a day without rain to dry her washing on the clothesline. That same day it was Christmas, but it didn't seem real. Where was the good Christmas smell of the goose cooking and the plum pudding simmering on the fire? Where were the colored paper chains hanging from the ceiling and the friends coming to the door? How could this ever be Christmas? But it was and they made it the best of it. Down in their cabin, the boy sat on Anthony's bed, one on each side of Annie, and she untied the string on Auntie's parcel. On the top was a letter, My dear children, it began. By now, your uncle and I will know how much we miss you. You are like our own, and you always will be. God keep you safe. Happy Christmas. There was a scarf for each of them, a red one for Anthony, a yellow one for Philip, <clears throat> and a blue for Annie. When did she ever knit these, Annie asked. I didn't see her making them. Philip pulled aside the rest of the paper. There's more. Wrapped in a cloth were three mince pies, plump with cur currants and raisins. I want my auntie, Philip wailed, rubbing his eyes. Now, now, it isn't the grand thing that we're well enough to eat what she sent. Take a bite, Philip, and enjoy your Christmas. Aren't you going to have yours, Annie? 
I'm keeping it for Mr. Victor, Annie said. I have nothing else for him. Anthony held out his pie. Here, have a bite of mine. And take a bite of mine, Philip added. But only a wee bit, Annie. You are dear boys. Annie held each taste in her mouth for as long as she could before swallowing. Never was mince pie so good. She picked up a juicy currant that had fallen on the blanket and popped it into her mouth. The last little twist of paper was so small they almost missed it. For Annie, it said, happy 15th birthday. Little Philip bounced on the bed, making it rattle. Open it, Annie, open it. Annie slid the package under her pillow. I won't be 15 for seven more days, Annie said. I should save it till then. Let's go now and find Mr. Victor. Put on your coats and scarves. Aren't they lovely and warm? I'm not sure if Jewish gentlemen keep Christmas. We can just tell him we wanted to share what we got from home. Anthony nodded. We can wish him a happy halfway to America Day from all of us. After Christmas, the weather was fine. Sun glittered on the ocean, and at night the moon spilled a shining path that shimmered to the horizon. We could walk on it all the way back home, Anthony said. Annie felt a sharp pang at her heart, but all she said was, Then our mother and father would be terribly sad. One night there was a party in the steerage, with an accordion playing music from home and from other countries far from Ireland. There were reels and polkas and jigs. Mr. Victor danced with Annie in a stiff old gentleman way that she loved. It was the day after that a seagull flew over the SS Nevada and landed on one of the masts. That means we come close to land, Mr. Victor told them. Annie shivered, close to America and all its strangeness. On the last night of 1891, the night before Annie's 15th birthday, the engine stopped and there was silence. In the windowless cabin, there was no way to see what was happening. But when they rushed into the corridor, a steward turned to them. No steerage passengers allowed on deck, he said. Are we there, Annie asked. We are, but nobody gets off till morning, and none of you are from steerage or allowed up till then. After the never-ending noise, the quiet in the cabin was almost unbearable. Anthony and Philip slept while Annie lay awake. Were their parents looking out at their ship? How would it be when they met after all this time? What would New York be like? Number 32 Monroe Street. She tried for so long to imagine it. They knew it was morning when the steward banged on their door and shouted, Get your things together, everybody up on deck. Dress yourselves extra warm now, Annie told her little brothers. Put on your woolen vests. It's colder here than in cork. Excitement fumbled their fingers and Annie had to help them with their buttons. Philip flung himself at her. Annie, did you forget it's your birthday? Open your present before we go. I will, but hush up. I have to get it. Annie took the curl of paper from the pocket of her suit where she put it the night before. She sat on Anthony's bed to open it. Anthony's eyes widened. It's Auntie's lovely ring. Annie stared down at it. The two little hearts joined together gleamed even in the gloom of the cabin. Soon, often, she'd seen the ring on Auntie's hand. They're not rubies, her Auntie had said one time, but your uncle gave me this ring when we were courting, and it's precious above rubies to me. Now it was Annie's. Her heart was full to bursting, and she slid it on her finger. It was a perfect fit. There was another bang on the door. Do you want to be left behind? Not one of them looked back as they hurried from the dark mouse hole of the cabin, up the stairs, up and up, bumping their bag behind them. The outside morning was filled with wind and sunshine. The decks were crowded. Annie saw two other ships at anchor in the harbor, in the distance were buildings and a wharf where small vo boats were moored and people who looked no bigger than blades of grass. Is that America, little Philip asked? Tis. And there was the statue. Annie dropped her bag and put her arms tight around her brothers. There she is, she whispered, the Statue of Liberty. Our daddy wrote about her, remember? Isn't she grand altogether? Some of the passengers were on their knees. One man, kept, one man kept pointing and calling out, Bella, Bella. Mr. Victor had come to stand beside them. Bella means beautiful in Italian, he said. My son say she is truly called liberty, enlightening the world. It is very nice, I think. Annie nodded. She is Bella, very, very Bella. Mr. Victor pointed. That land is Ellis Island. 
We will go to the building, the one flying the big flag, 